Yes, thank you for that very warm welcome. We've got lots of dogs in the audience. It's fantastic. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring. Wait for the dogs. It's probably been my voice. It's like piercing their ears. Oh, to settle down. <laughs> Um, so I am the host of the Tough Girl podcast, founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating, and inspiring women and girls. And I interview incredible women who share their stories of adventure and challenges. And that's what we're going to be doing today. So it's over to Emma. I would love for you to introduce yourself, tell everybody your name, a little bit more information about who you are, what you do and where you're currently based. So hi, everyone. I'm Em. Um, that's my dog, Molly, um, going on a rampage. Um, I'm, I'm an artist, really. Um, I began baking a couple of years ago. Um, but mainly I love the open road. Um, I, um, I love the unknown. Um, I love not knowing who I'll meet or where I'll sleep. And I, I love a challenge. So I set off, uh, when I was 24, uh, just after art school, um, on a journey from the UK to Mongolia and back. Um, in Mongolia, I found Molly and adopted her, and she came back on my back seat, took up all my suitcase space. Um, so I traveled pretty light, other than the dog. Um, and um, yeah, I'm now running an Artie Bakes van, uh, which some of you might have come across. It's a colorful wacky looking sort of 70s van selling bakes and cakes and things like that so have you always been artistic have you always sort of loved the outdoors you know when you were growing up you know where did this stem from yeah I think so my parents uh, my mum's an artist uh, my dad was a, a huge fan of the open road uh, mum never kind of got it I love the fact that you can just get to a from a to b um, it's simple. It's a simple life. I struggle when I get back home and, um, you know, all the paperwork and the whole job thing and, um, it's all quite tricky really. But, uh, when you're just trying to get from A to B, um, I feel pretty comfortable with a challenge. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I was always, I was always a bit, um, a little bit like that. I, I, yeah, I'd, um, ever since I was tiny, my mum said when I was about five years old, I jumped into a swimming pool, no idea how to swim. Um, but I got quite a kick out of that. I, I, I've always liked the challenge, basically. So one of the challenges that we're going to be talking about is your incredible journey from Dorset to Jakarta in Indonesia, a journey of over 30,000 kilometers, which took you two years. And I'm actually like a massive planner. So I'm almost feeling quite stressful when I ask you the question, like how much planning and preparation did you do before this big trip, this big adventure? You know, where did this dream come from? Um, so the dream was always there. I traveled to India um, several times. Um, and I'd also bought Gretel, the Vespa, in 2013. So I'd done a few trips around Europe, but I was at university at the time. So I could never get further than Croatia before I was called out by university. And they said, look, it's your turn on the cafe shift. Where are you? And I'd be on a beach somewhere <laughs> and have to get back pronto. Um, but um, so the first chance I got to do the overland trip, the dream really, uh, which was bit mainly just towards India. Um, Mongolia was never the plan. Um, but I landed up in Mongolia because I'd stop and teach along the way. I left with very little money. I left with probably a thousand pounds in all, which I, I thought at the time was quite a lot. Um, but, um, but so the plan was to paint, uh, sell artwork and teach when I ran out of money. Um, and, um, yeah, so there was, I tried to plan, I tried to plan visas. Uh, visas were a nightmare. Um, but I had no idea where, how long it would take a Vespa to get to Afghanistan. So in the end, I set off as a learner without a full bike test and with no visas, with very little money, no tools, no spare kit. And, um, and I just set off and hoped for the best. Um, and it worked out pretty well. Um, yeah, I love that. Hoping for the best. 
but talking about have a bit of hope the the realities of you know thinking i'm gonna i'm gonna paint i'm gonna get work along the way i'm gonna earn money that way how easy was it to do that to actually earn the money to continue your journey it was a lot of planning so i did a tefl course so teaching english in a foreign language so i taught the first time in kyrgyzstan at an international school so i taught a, a combination of english and art um, first in Kyrgyzstan, and that's how I ended up in Mongolia, because while I was in Kyrgyzstan, they then offered me a job in Mongolia. So, um, But but you, you had to do the prep for it. Um, I mean, it's just endless hours online. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, it did take a lot of paper. It took a lot of, lot of planning. Um, but I was so excited by the idea of just getting on two wheels by myself, finally just going on an overland trip. Um, so it was all all worth it. Did your imagination about what it was going to be like match reality? Yeah. It was an amazing adventure. Um, I had no idea what to expect. I just took a tent um, to sleep in. I took my sketchbooks. Um, and um, I, I loved... Um, I loved not knowing what the next day would would be like. You, you had no idea who who you'll meet, where you'll sleep, um, and and obviously a Vespa is not ideal for off land along the Silk Road. The, the wheels are so small that um, you know I knew the bike wasn't ideal, but I loved Gretel um, and Gretel's the Vespa. Sorry. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, she was, she was amazing. Um, yeah. One of the amazing things when you go traveling is the people that you get to meet along the way. And I'm sure you had so many magical encounters. I'd love for you to share maybe just some of those, those people, those experiences, those connections. Yeah. Well, the people made the trip. Um, honestly, if it wasn't for local people, I could not have done this trip. Um, I completely put my hands, uh, put put myself in their hands, um, and because um, I was on my own, you meet a whole load more people, and I relied entirely on them. And even though I couldn't speak the language, um, I got really good at charades, so I'm really good at sign language now. But, um, but you know, it, despite the language barrier um, and the lack of um, mechanical knowledge or anything, like the the people made it possible. They were so kind. Everywhere I went, from country to country, the further east I got, the kind of people became. You know, and I'd been warned by everyone. They said. You know, once you get past Turkey, don't trust anyone, you know, be really careful. And actually, um, it's a shame in a way, because um, the more trust you, I think that you put in people, the more they help you out. Um, you sort of give what you get in a way. And um, I totally put myself in their hands as a single female, and they completely repaid that. Um Fully. I mean, people were incredibly kind. And that was the main thing that I take from my trip, um, was just how incredibly nice 99% of the world is. Um, that's the main thing I take from it. Before you left, did you have any sort of fears or concerns, or even maybe when you were talking with your friends or your parents, or having people say, oh, you need to be careful about X, Y, Z? You know, did people get into your head? And, and yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But as I as I as I continued the journey, I I realized how how kind people were. Um so I did have that because everyone would say, you know, be um be really cautious, you know, it's almost like you're going out expecting to be mugged straight away. Um I was mugged a couple of times. Um but that was in two and a half years and you know, they probably needed the money. So, um and in fact, one of them gave my passport back. If you've ever met such a thing as a kind mugger, um, <laughs> I definitely met one of them. Um, so I don't know, at the end of the day, um, I think that the world is a good place. And um, and I learned that as I drove further and further. And um, yeah, uh, 
I also realize you can solve problems along the way. So as you say, I I did try and plan stuff and you couldn't really. But I think if you go off with a good attitude and you're positive and you trust in people, uh, anything is really possible. Could you just talk us through the route? So where you left from? So you left from Dorset and then what? where did you go? Yeah. What did that look like? So I left from deepest, darkest Dorset, um, down in Charmouth, if anyone's been there. Um, so along Europe, um, through Greece to Turkey, from Turkey, I boarded a cargo ship across the Caspian Sea. No, that's Azerbaijan, sorry. So from Turkey, Azerbaijan, on a cargo ship to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, um, over the Pamirs, the Karakoram Highway, um, really beautiful landscape. Um, then into over the Altai Mountains in Russia and into Western Mongolia, all the way down to the capital of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, and then back um, a different route. Um, I took a beeline back in a rush for my brother's wedding with Molly, the dog, um, back through Siberia, the length of Russia into Latvia, Northern Europe, and back down to deepest, darkest dogs. So how did you meet Molly? Tell us the story. Did your eyes meet? No. Well, I actually, I was teaching in Mongolia, and um, there's an organization in Ulaanbaatar called Lucky Paws, and they rescue strays. Um, and Molly was really badly injured. She had a terrible neck injury. Someone had basically tied her up. They're not good with stray dogs. In Mongolia, if you have a dog, they're generally guard dogs, and they're sort of, um, they don't really do pets. Um, And Moll was found by Lucky Paws with a wire noose in her neck, and her neck had healed over the wire. Um, so they had to cut the net, neck open to get this wire out. And um, I looked to adopt because I thought I was going to be in Mongolia for some time. Um, I hadn't really thought through all, everything uh, with traveling because I wasn't planning on traveling that soon until my brother said he was getting married. Um, but, um, but anyway, so she was a really timid little dog when I found her, badly injured. It took months to heal the neck up. And um, and then I started training her how to jump in the on in the bag and on the bike. And um, she loves Gretel. Um, she gets super excited. She can hear the ignition from miles away and she'll hop on the back seat, uh, which I'll show you later today if you want to come see. Gretel will be here as well, the Vespa. And um, yeah, she took to it like a like a duck to water. How was it traveling with her? Like, was she good? Sort of like meeting strangers? Did it help? Like, initiate she was conversation? so good. Um, she's the best travel companion ever. Um, no, she was great. I'd have a bucket of chicken at the front of Gretel, and I'd pass her wings as we went down the highway, and um, and and you know, she learned how to jump in the tent, and um, I because I was super worried, maybe she wouldn't like the bike. You know, I'd be a bit scared if I was a dog, and I got on the back of a beaten up Vespa, taken off to England. But um, no, she loved it, and she was the most amazing <laughs> companion to have with me. So you finished your trip in 2017. You've had a few sort of years now, maybe to reflect back on that journey. Yeah. And what would you say are some of the, like the key lessons that you've learned from that experience? Um, I would say that um, um, I w- I would say that the main thing, as I've already said, really is that I was astonished about how kind the entire world is, um, which is a really nice thing because when I go back to England, you know, you're just watching the news, you're stuck at home, it's locked down, you're on the sofa, and everyone, you know, it's really, um, that's what I took the most from the trip was um, how incredibly kind everyone was. Um, and, you know, despite despite any language barrier, um, they all were amazing. Uh, that That's the main thing I took from the trip. Um, 
One of the things that you mentioned earlier at the start was, you know, sort of adjusting back to normal life, dealing with bills and yeah. having a job. And what was it like finishing your travel, coming home again? How was that adjustment for you? That was actually really difficult. So I moved first to London. Um, I did Deliveroo on Gretel on the bike, <laughs> Molly on the back, pizzas <laughs> between my legs. Um uh, but I did find it really tough, you know, because I was used to every day being a challenge. But it was a, it was simple in a way, you know. It was just life. You're finding a place to sleep. You're finding something to eat, and you're getting from A to B. So in a way, that's simple, and I loved that. And then when you got back, it all got complicated. You know, you're supposed to find a place in London, find find a job. There's tons of paperwork involved and health and safety get in the way. I, I don't know. I did find it a challenge. And um, I was a bit wobbly for a while, actually, after the trip. You know, I, um, I got back and I just, I didn't quite know what to do with myself. You know, I was so used to that challenge every day. Um, but in the end, I... Um, I started baking brownies for fun and, and now I've got a great van. So, so it all worked out in the end. Just going back to what you said, you know, almost like feeling like having a bit of a wobble and sort of getting through that. I'm sure there are other people who may be going through situations where they're sort of either just not knowing what they want to mm. do, whether they want to go on an adventure, you know, whether they're feeling a bit, a bit frustrated, a little bit, a little bit stuck. What advice would you have for people who are going through that wobble? Um... I think the main thing is to follow your heart with what you enjoy doing. So in the end, I tried all sorts of things because I love art. And when I got back, I tried to do the portraits, but I just, I was, I was a bit lost really. And it all became about how to earn some money. And so I stopped doing what I sort of enjoy because I love art, but it became a different thing. And in the end, what helped me out was uh, doing something that I'd never done before, uh, bake some brownies. And, um, and you know, it's, it's sort of the things you least expect that can help you out sometimes. Um, I think just to let go for a minute, do something that you really, just something new, something that you enjoy. Um, and, um, and that led to all of this. And for me, that's what got me out of, of my wobble. Um, and actually, you know, it's kind of like traveling. I've, I've got a great little van and go over. I still meet all the people. It's all about the people, I think. Um, but Have you got any more future sort of journeys that you would like to go on? Yeah, so Cape Town, um, from here to Cape Town in September with Carl over there and Molly, of course, and Gretel. Um, Wait, sorry, all of you on the... Vespa. <laughs> Not all of us. Carl's now got a Vespa too. Um, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, hopefully from the UK to Cape Town in September. My brother lives in Cape Town, so I thought it was a good destination. So down there, over the Pyrenees, um, through the Sahara and down the west coast of Africa. Um, leave the bike at my brother's house. So hopefully we're traveling from summer to summer. And then if if um if we've still got time and enough money, come back up the East Coast. If not, leave the bike there, fly home and finish the journey off the next year. Incredible. Um, what would could you sort of talk us through like what a typical day looks like? You know, is it setting alarms? Is it waking up when oh, you feel no, like it's it? Such <laughs> fun. You're just in your open tent. Um I'm an early riser, so I'd um I just wake up at five and um and start driving. Um, I'd nibble on bits and pieces. Um, I didn't have any cooker or anything like that. So it was always nice when I met other travelers that would have <laughs> all the kit. Um, but um, but no, I, I would feast off sort of bread and cheese. I'd sleep in the tent and I loved it. I'd sleep under the stars every night and... Um, Wake up at five. I usually finish at around five as well. So it was sort of 12 hours driving on the whole. Um, but you're just traveling in the landscape. I mean, what could be nicer? Oh, amazing. And I'd love to open up if any questions from the audience, any particular areas that we want to dig into detail. I was just wondering how it was going to Afghanistan. 
So let me just repeat the question. So the question was, what was it like going through Afghanistan as a single woman? Um, it was wonderful. The people were great. Um, really, really nice, really helpful. There was actually a huge landslide um, when I hit Afghanistan. Um, it was on the Wakhan Corridor, which borders Tajikistan. And no one had been able to cross this landslide for like three days. So um, vehicles had been stuck. Um, everyone said the road is closed. And amusingly, the only vehicle that could cross was the Vespa. Because she was small and light enough that all the local kids, all the local people, they all grouped together. And we carried Gretel over this mountain to reach a sort of round of applause on the other side. Who'd been watching this tiny mint green Vespa. Um, for sort of several hours because it was about a three mile landslide, and um, but I needed to get out because I my visa was finishing and I had, I had to go to to a job. I had my school was all ready, kids were waiting, and I was stuck in a landslide in Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually tell them I was traveling there by bike. I thought they'd think I was too mad and they wouldn't offer me the job, so they were expecting me to arrive at the airport. <laughs> I instead arrived by tow rope. Um. <laughs> How did you build up your knowledge with mechanics? Like if Gretel, um, Gretel sort of like broke down at all. How did you manage that, especially when you were in sort of more remote countries? So this is where the tow rope comes in. I was so pleased with myself. So because um, I didn't know anything about mechanics. I did learn a bit on the trip and I'd gather up some tools. And by the end, I had a small toolkit. Um, but basically, I had this yellow and green rope, which I put in Gretel's pocket. And when I would break down, I would stop the next car or bike, insist that they stop, tie the rope around Gretel's headlamp to their tow bar and insist that they tow me to the next place. <laughs> um, and it was a really good method. I mean, I hit 90, 100 miles an hour. <laughs> Um, it was actually, it was it was really amazing. once I realized it worked because I was a bit worried the first with a car it's one thing, but being towed by another bike was a whole different thing and I didn't know if it would work. Um, but it was it was great. Um, and so from then on that was my go to method carry a rope, and um because it was difficult to get her in trucks sometimes I'd always have my eye out for the right kind of track that I could get Gretel into that's. My eyes were just constantly um, on the lookout for the right sort of truck, you know, with a with a back that opens and, and that you could tie Gretel onto. But once I realized I could be towed, um, all my problems were really solved quite quickly. And I would make sure they stopped. I'd stand in the middle of the road. So unless they ran me over, they had to stop. How many times have you come off your bike? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. We won't mention last night, but um, <laughs> um, no, not that many. I was a, a careful. I was caref more careful with Molly because once I had a passenger, it was a whole different thing. Um, but I had one very bad crash in Istanbul um, on the way, and I thought they said Gretel was a write-off. Um, I I didn't have any sat nav Google Maps or anything the whole way to Kyrgyzstan. Um, so I was using paper maps and that was very well getting from country to country. But a city appeared as a small dot on my map. So getting to a hostel or something like that was a real challenge. So I'd uh, form the habit of um, stopping and I'd ask locals all the time. It was all the people that, that got me through this trip. But I misunderstood directions from um, one of them. They said this. And I thought that means turn left. So I took a left turn and I, I obviously took the wrong left turn. And it was a four-way motorway. I was really lost in Istanbul. I couldn't read any of the signposts. And I was just I was scooting to the side of the road on the motorway trying to ask directions. And it was, it was a lot of hooting and... And I had a very bad crash. So it turned out to be a one-way system. And I rounded a corner. And at the same time as I rounded a corner, four lanes of traffic came the other way. Oh under, a, um, a, it was a sort of like under a tunnel. Um, so I couldn't see it. So I only had a split second. And there was no way to move. 
um, so I came off the bike. I was taken off to hospital, and and so I was concussed. And Gretel was taken to a scrapyard, um, and um, and then at hospital, I found these amazing police officers, and they homed me, took me to the outskirts of Istanbul where they lived, five police officers. They kept saying, have more medicine, have more medicine. They were giving me lots of red wine. And in the end, I um, I recovered, and they found Gretel. They found the key, which was missing. So they said, without the key, we can't fix your bike. So then there was this, they had to go back to the scene of the accident, and they found this key, super bent. It's still really bent now. I have no spare. Um, and, um, they found that and the mechanics hammered her back into shape for 80 quid, wired up the electrics. Uh, that is why she looks like she does now, if any of you have seen Gretel. Um, and, um, and, uh, yeah, amazing. So I was back on the road again, but that was really scary. Um, and I thought the trip had come to a halt. They thought I was mad in the ambulance. They said, is there anything you need to ask? Are you all right? And I thought Gretel was a goner. I remember looking up over the road, oil everywhere, and then my bike was just smashed under this van. And all I could think about was whether they, you know, whether I could take a camel or a horse. So in the ambulance, I said, well, do they do camels here? <laughs> um, and I think they thought it was the head injury, but actually I was totally sober and I was thinking straight. Um, yeah. Why did you name the bike Gretel? Is there a story behind the name? Yeah. Um, so uh, Gretel's the only bike I've ever really owned. Um, but in the past, I've I've traveled a lot to India. Um, and I love the film The Sound of Music. Don't know who else here loves that, but I think it's a brilliant film. <laughs> so all of the bikes that I've ever owned and driven have been named after characters in The Sound of Music. So I've had Frau Schmidt, the housekeeper, Fräulein Helga, um, Captain Captain von Trapp, von. the bar- yeah, um, and Gretel is the youngest child. Liesel now is the Artie Bakes fan. Who's the eldest child? Um, but this won't make any sense to anyone that hasn't seen the sound of music. But yeah, there is a, a story behind it. So after your accident, did you feel any sort of apprehension about getting back on the bike again? No, I was so excited to have Gretel back. I mean, I had knees like puffer fish. Um, but um, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I, th- I thought the trip had come to an end. And um, and I just, I couldn't be any Guys, it helped me out for eight pounds. Bargain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions in the audience or other areas that we want to delve into? So I'll just repeat the questions. The questions around sort of food. You ate a lot of bread and cheese, but what sort of other food were you eating maybe when you couldn't buy that in other countries? So Russia, the main thing, luckily Molly loves it as well. So we'd share breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, And that was mainly boiled eggs and chicken. But Molly would only eat the yolk. She didn't like the white. So I had to eat the egg white. She'd eat the yolk and we'd share the chicken. Um, on the way out, on the whole, every few days or every week, you could find a little place that would do bread. And they did this amazing, I don't know if you guys have ever tried it. It's this, I can't find it. I tried to order it on Amazon. It's like a salted, it's like a cheese string, but salted, smoked cheese and in strings and it, huge clumps of it. And it would last forever. So I would, I would live on that. Um, bread until it went stale and um yeah quite little really but you you were blogging your journey as well how was keeping your blog updated throughout the trip how did that work Uh, so every every couple of weeks I would if I it was mainly when I'd stop for a visa and I'd be in a city for a while and um and I had a chance to write and the main point of writing really was so that I because I'm not really a blogger Uh, It goes against the grain, really, to do a blog. But I thought it would help because I wanted to write a book um, on the trip, and which I am going to do. It's in the pipeline. 
Um, because I also sketch the whole journey, so it's all illustrated with um with sketches and everything. So I'd stop every couple of weeks and write. Um, and I think the book is going to be called um Chance Encounters and the Generosity of Strangers, hopefully with illustrations as well. But it's just a matter of putting it all together. Where would you go back to? Um, Tajikistan. Why? A beautiful landscape, beautiful people. Just, um, I, I think as well, I'd just come out of the Uzbek deserts, which were, there was a heat wave and it was like 65 degrees. And it was really tough getting through the deserts. Um, and then I was finally into this, like, amazing mountain landscape um and it was cool and fresh and beautiful and i went as high as i've ever gone on gretel in tajikistan we went over the pamirs so um i I was honestly high on on altitude on life on people on the landscape i've never felt so happy in my head, I've got this picture of you at like the top of a mountain pass yeah. <laughs> on the Vespa, and you're yeah. thinking, "Oh, I'll save some money on fuel. Let's just turn it <laughs> off." And <laughs> no, so you're quite right. That's exactly it, really. And actually, at the time, my battery was melting, and I had to stop sort of every twenty minutes on a sort of ninety degree angle and put more battery fuel in the battery. Uh, Gretel was beginning to break by this point, um, and. Um, so it was quite difficult, but it was it was just amazing. And the people were amazing. You know, you'd stay at these little homestays and um, I'd have my fried eggs in the morning. You, you mentioned about the heat. Did you ever have to deal with, like, extreme cold? Yeah. So um, from, from the 65-degree heat of the Uzbek desert, um, Mongolia was minus 35. Um, that's where I found Moll and I was teaching at a school there to earn enough money to get back home. Um, and that was really tough as well. Um, it was, it was freezing. Um, I tried, um, yeah, I tried Molly in socks because she couldn't, she couldn't, um, stand on all four of her feet. I didn't know how she was a street dog or where she was before I found her, but, um, but uh, but yeah, she it was so cold she couldn't put her paws down, so she'd be trying to sort of you know eventually she'd just roll over. Um, Has Molly adjusted well to the UK? I think she's having a pretty good life at the minute. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> spoil rotten. Where are you most active on social media? Well, I'm a little bit of a technophobe, um, but I'm trying my best, and um, I'm on. Um, so the, the blog that I wrote is on emmatrenchard.com, which is actually my art website. Um, and, um, baking. So I don't really have a travel channel. Vespa's just made a really amusing documentary though. If you guys want to have a bit of a laugh, it's only 10 minutes and it's, um, on YouTube. It's called Vespa mania. Um, and it's, uh, because they heard, Vespa heard about the trip a couple of years ago, so they flew over from America and did this documentary. Um, so there's that on YouTube, and my art thing is artybakes.com. Um, so yeah, but otherwise I'm not, I'm not very savvy on the line. I'm trying harder, but. And is it with the book, like? I don't want to put pressure on you, but do you th- do you have an idea of when that would maybe be finished? Yeah, I'm thinking the w- so I've been so busy with the with Artie Bakes that I've got so many projects in the pipeline, and the book is the first one for the winter because I figured uh, after the season, um, now that I know the Artie Bakes thing is working and everything, which I've never really had before, you know, I never quite knew where I was going with life. Um, and now I know the summer's super busy. You get no sleep. In the winter, you get a bit more sleep and um, time to write the book. Hopefully. I'm sure you'll do it. It's going to be very, <laughs> very exciting. But um, Emma, I'd love for you to have the final words, final words of advice, final words of wisdom, especially for other people out there who do you want to take on an epic challenge. Apart from just do it, what advice would you like to share? Um, I personally would say trust other people. Um, trust the fact that the world is actually a pretty good place. Um, and, and I would say if you think too much all about the ifs and buts, 
uh, you would never go. So I would say act on a bit of impulse as well and instinct because um, I probably do that a bit too much and it gets me into all sorts of trouble. But um, but it's worth it sometimes. Um, and um, I've found that I've always had luck on my side and I think that's just because I believe in luck um, and in people. And I think what you believe in, you sort of get back. Um, so that's what I would say. Love it. Impulse, instinct, and believe in yourself. I think so, yeah. Emma, thanks so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. It's no been amazing way. to share your story. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.